when hand sanitizer first came out years ago, um, this is this is a picture of a person worked at a company. They came out of the bathroom, used a hand sanitizer, went out on a windy day, and had a cigarette and lit it, and it lit their hands on fire. And you can see it burned their skin. Uh, we had a we had a guy in Lodi, which is just south of us, 15 miles or so, and he was at a welding company. Went in the bathroom, used a hand sanitizer, and he was using a torch before this. If he put his gloves on, it would have been all right. But he went over to the torch, grabbed it with his bare hands, lit it, and it burned his skin black on both hands. It was really a bad burn. So sometimes weird stuff happens. And one reason I put this in here, too, is we all know now that with the coronavirus that, you know, we're going to be using a lot of hand sanitizer. So make sure they are dry. Make sure you have gloves on. Another thing, too, is you can wash, you can wash, you know, you can use the hand sanitizer and then go and use a faucet, too, and wash them off again. Along with the, this flammable material, uh, hairsprays, if you have people who are using hairsprays, there are some people who use um, other hair products that are flammable. And then this last year, we had a young lady who used some kind of a body spray um, and was welding and all of a sudden we had these light blue flames dancing around her face and neck and it singed her hair but it it, it was so light a covering that it, it evaporated quickly but at the same time it did catch on fire around her neck and face yeah, just something that you know when this first came out nobody was thinking about that so yeah, yeah because that's you know alcohol gel all right identifying hazards in your shop Whoops. Um, identifying hazards in your shop. Um, you got to keep an eye on things and periodically check things um, to keep things safe. Um, electric wise, I mean, a kid can use a grinder outside and accidentally grind your electric cord or the cord on the grinder. And all of a sudden, you got bare wire shelf. So, you know, periodically I check the cord. I'd say probably once a week I check all the cords on the grinders. I also tell the kids, hey, if you see something, let me know we got a, a problem. But I check them at least once a week, all the, all the cords on the grinders, um, all the other power tools too. Um, also, your welding cables I periodically check. Um, and go along with your electrode holders and your grounding clamps. You got to make sure, okay, that you do not have any cut metal, nothing's melted or anything. So, just some periodic, periodically you want to check. Um, usually, if a kid's grounding clamp clamp comes loose, you know, I will fix it immediately, and then I'll, as soon as I have time, I'll check them all just to make sure. Because if that one's loose, others could be loose. So I, I you know, periodically check that stuff too. Um, you don't want anybody getting zapped. Um, the next one, compressed gases. <laughs> that would be any kind of welding gas, cutting gases, things like that. Make sure that you have, a, if you have extras, make sure they're in a storage area. Make sure that you have the welding gases and the oxygen, okay, on one side, and have all the, the uh, cutting gases, the fuel gases on the other. Now, your welding gas like CO2, argon, they can be on either side. I usually keep them with the oxygen. Um, but they got to be divided. And they either got to be, the, they got to be, the, somebody, I think it's 25 feet apart if you, if you don't have a storage building. Or you got to have a big, like my, my building is um, cinder blocks full of concrete. So the, the, the wall in between them has to be rated for so many hours. So anyway, that's really important you keep them separate. Make sure they're chained up, every one of them. Make sure that they cannot come out. Welding machines and carts, make sure they're chained and clamped properly. Something else on carts, you know, I'm talking about carts for cutting torches and welding torches. Periodically check the hoses, check the regulators, check the torches. I always tell the kids if they smell anything or hear anything, to let me know if we got a leak. Got to make sure those you know you do a good job of that. 
And make sure that when you change your cylinders, you mark the empties and you put them, you got to mark the empties and put them back, you know, on the oxygen side or the fuel gas side, wherever they're at. It's important that you do that. Uh, a lot of times they're more dangerous empty than they are full. Um, so, you know, welding gases and, and cutting gas is real important you properly take care of those. Another thing is make sure you keep them free of oil and grease. Um, it could cause an explosion. Uh, when you mix pure oxygen under pressure with grease or oil under the right circumstances, it can explode. So you always want to make sure you keep your cutting torches and your welding torches away from any kind of grease or oil. Okay, next one, fire prevention. Uh, fire extinguishers, fire blanket, flammable liquid storage, and dirty rag storage. You don't want to put a bunch of rags with different chemicals on it and put them in a, an open can and have, you know, spontaneous combustion happen and light a fire. So <clears throat> usually we throw them away or put, I have a, I have a bucket we put them in. Um, wash them and reuse them. Um, flammable liquid storage is important there in a, a yellow cabinet and marked. It's nice to have a fire blanket. Not that I've ever had to use one, but you never know. I have had to use one a couple when kids were working on vehicles and things caught on fire. I've used that a couple times for that. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions about that? Make sure you have enough fire extinguishers and they're well marked because the fire chief will check for that and you need it for safety. Yeah, I have one question about your gas tanks. You mentioned that empty tanks could be hazardous as well, maybe even more so than filled. Why exactly is that? Because the reason why is because if you, if, say you left the, uh, if you left maybe a valve open on one or something and it got a spark in it, you've got to now have air or an oxygen mixed in with that gas instead of just pure fuel. That's what could cause that a serious explosion. The other hazard behind that, if you leave, if you have an empty tank, for example, a CO2 or an oxygen tank and it's empty and you leave the valve open, humid air will then enter the tank and it will actually start um, rusting the tank from the inside. So they want those tanks kept closed so to prevent any type of uh, contamination on the inside. One quick thing you can do with your, your students, um, take a little plate of steel and on one side they have to weld the word full, on the flip side they have to weld the word empty and then put either a piece of chain or a piece of wire or something on that so that you create a little harness. And it's real easy and fast to stick those things um, around the neck of the, the bottle and we actually, our school colors are blue and gold so one, one side, the full side is blue and the empty side is gold. So we can just look and by color and see whether it's full or empty. Um, at my school, we have steel rings, like when it's empty, we put a, we have a, just a round ring we throw on there and we mark it also with soapstone. Uh, and we mark, mark the letters empty on it. That's, that's how, how most companies will do it, so. It's important you don't get the fulls mixed with the empties because then you don't know what you have. Really important to keep those separated. Um, let's see, next one. Hand tool, power tool, and fabrication power machine. Safety instruction, inspection, maintenance. Now, my worst fear in my shop is we have a 140 ton shear and we have a 50 ton shear. My greatest fear is that a kid we're going to have a kid cut his finger off. He's going to be laying down there on the sheer table. So um, whenever I have, first off, my beginning students are not allowed to use the shears. And, and so the advanced guys do. But I make sure if I have a student shear metal and I have all the kids in my advanced class do it, I make sure that I watch them first. And we've already gone over it on safety, but I'll review it again. And as they cut, I will go over it with them. Real important that they don't have anybody talking to them while they're cutting. Because it, that's when they can cut that finger off. 
So, um, but any kind of hand tool, power tools, and fabrication machinery, that's what, you know, can really hurt people. So you got to be careful. I always go over them. I'll take the, for instance, when we go over grinding tools, my beginning students, uh, just real quick, in our, in our program, the freshman students go to Brian Dotson, and so he gets the freshman for a year. So they have a basic shop class where they go over safety, go over tool ID. Some years they do a little woodworking, metalworking, plumbing, small engines. They get a little bit of all that. And so our, that's how we're set up. So as freshmen, they have a general shop class. And then as they want to take the welding classes, they are a three-year class. Beginning welding is one year and advanced is two. Um, so just to give you an idea. So they get a lot of safety, safety instruction. Um, periodically, too, um, you need to inspect your machines. Uh, if you have a bandsaw, for instance, which I only allow my, my, my advanced kids to use also because the blades are $85 a piece, um, I only let them, you know, use it if I supervise and watch them a couple times so they, you know, they know what's, what, how to properly use it so they won't damage it and they won't do something that could hurt them. So, and it's, it's important, like, if you've got a teeth missing or a couple teeth missing, then the saw starts to jump. I tell the kids, hey, if you mess up the blade, tell me, you know, tell me anyway. Because we cannot have it like that and make it dangerous. So, uh, same. Uh, real quick, I, another thing that's real, you know, could be real serious is a drill press. The first year I taught, I had a student, we were, we were drilling holes in a one-inch thick steel plate. And I said, make sure you clamp it properly before we drill the holes. I said, have me check it. The student clamped it down, not very good, didn't have me check it, starts drilling. And the one inch drill bit grabbed the steel plate, ripped it out of the clamps, threw it like five feet and it just stuck in the wall. And, you know, I heard it happen. I said, oh my God, lucky didn't kill somebody. So, you know, things like that, boy, you gotta be real careful. You gotta make sure the kids tell you you know, when, if they're drilling something, you want to always check and make sure that they're doing it correctly. Don't just let them do it, especially on thicker plates. Um, the next one, exhaust hoods. Uh, in our, in our, we have self-contained uh, welding booths. They're made by Clean Air America. They pick up all the welding smoke and dust. Filter that and put that same air back in the shop. And periodically, you got to clean them. Um, and, and when you do clean them, you got to save that welding dust and put it in a special container for the hazardous materials. Um, I'm doing that right now to our welding booths, and it is a nasty job. Um, got to make make sure you wear a mask too. You won't be breathing that stuff. Um, the last thing there, you know. In my class, I'm a mean, I, I conduct my class just like it was a, I worked in industry for 10 years. I conduct my class just like we're, we're you know, we're a company. And there's absolutely no tolerance for kids not wearing safety glasses, wearing face shields, and all the safety protection equipment. It's really important that they follow them. If they don't, I say some very unkind words to them. They will get detention if they do not do what I tell them. Um, and uh, whenever you have visitors, Greg and I were talking about this the other day, whenever you have had visitors, you want to make sure you have some safety glasses there readily available you know, that you can give them. Or an extra welding helmet if they want to watch people weld and things like that. So it's nice to have those so you protect visitors too. Anybody have any questions about any of this? One quick thing I'd like to add when going back to the grinders. Um, grinders are probably one of the most dangerous tools that we're operating. And um, students have to be very, very aware of where those grinding sparks and debris are gonna be heading. And um, we had two seniors uh, last year that were both hit in the eye. They were wearing safety glasses, but they were hit in the eye from the side by grinder debris from other students grinding. 
and one of them was, was at the Skills USA State competition. Uh, and so, you know, you really need to make sure that those students are paying attention. And if you are using angle grinders with those wire cut brushes, those things will throw wire pieces that will stick and they will travel a long way. So please make sure your students are angling those things down so that that debris and stuff is going uh, away from other students. And also, if you can do that, and Mark's already mentioned it, have it someplace outside or someplace with a fan on it to keep that uh, airborne debris out of their lungs. So very important. So, so going back to your, your uh, shear, um, you said that uh, you'll watch them do it the first time and then you'll let them do it. And do you, are they doing it by themselves or are they grouping them like the way Greg has them? Like he said, he has them in groups. And, and, and will one of them be like a safety watch, uh, just to kind of uh, emphasize everything you already put put into um, to their attention to, to uh, keep keep an eye out for them. Yeah, that's a good question. Now, when we have a lot of the metal I get. It'll be twenty feet long. It'll be ten feet long. We're cutting it in six inch plates. We're cutting okay. it in all these plates. Normally. Um, if you bring a 20 foot piece in, three eighths metal, one guy's not gonna be able to do it safely. No. So have both kids come in. Uh -huh. They mark it, they bring it in, and they mount it on the machine and they mark it. Then I check the marks to make sure we're getting six inch plates and not five and three quarters. And then, and then I have them cut them. We'll cut it in half and I'll have one kid cut half of it, another kid the other half. And that's an excellent question. I don't let them talk to each other though why they're cutting. Yeah, usually, most of the time, you know, we have longer metal. I do have kids work on it as a team. That's, that's a really good question. Yeah. What I do is, is with the 20-foot links, we carry it in, and we will cut it first thing into four or five-foot sections. So, therefore, we're not having a keystone tops type thing, people swinging big pieces of metal and hitting each other. And are you using a shear as well or an iron worker? Iron worker. Okay, here's another safety picture. I don't know if this is OSHA approved. Okay, uh, first aid real quick. Um, and Greg suggested this, yearly first aid CPR training certification for teeth. It's a good idea. Now, I, I coached football for a long time, so we always had CPR every year. I don't now, but it's a good, really good idea you get CPR training and first aid training on a regular basis, uh, just in case there is an injury and you, you can you can do the right thing. Um, and I always encourage students must report all injuries to me, serious or not. They get a little burn, I got burn cream. You know, I had, I had, a, I had a tenth grader a couple of years ago, when you shear a plate really sharp on the edge, you, that's why we have leather work gloves to protect their hands and this kid, handle it, cut his hand open. He rubbed it on there the wrong way, cut his hand open. He didn't want to tell me. He stuck it in his pocket, and he came up to me with his plate. And I looked at his pocket, and it was red. And I said, pull your hand out. He cut it really bad. So I tell kids, no matter how bad the injury, I want to see it. You know, if we got to get stitches, we'll do it. we got to keep it clean. Not, don't let it get infected. And, you know, if we got to get stitches, we will. Make sure you have an industrial first aid kit. You know, if you get a cut, things like that, burn crane, and welding class, it's real important you have that. And make sure that you keep it filled up. Um, eye chemical wash station, this is nice to have. In case kid gets something in his eye or gets chemical. Not that we use a lot of chemicals, but just in case. And then, you know, with the new coronavirus thing, we have to make sure we have hand wash stations. I have sinks in my class right now, but it'd be nice to have some of that alcohol cleaning stuff too that we can use. Whoops. Okay. This is what happens when you wear a ring on your hand, you get it cut on a piece of metal. And I preach, you know, I preach that uh, in my, to my students, don't wear jewelry of any kind. Um, yeah, that's a tough picture. Um, the um, you, uh, 
I had a friend that had a ring on. He had his wedding ring on. He's a mechanic. He was working on. He got it. He was working on a battery on the starter too, and he got his, his. He didn't have gloves on. Got the ring near the hot side. It melted around his finger. His finger got infected. He ended up losing his finger. So it's real important that you do not do that. No necklaces. No bracelets. Because that's the kind of stuff that can happen. Got to be real careful. Okay. Can I jump in, Mark? Yeah, go ahead. Real quick with the first aid um, and fire extinguisher, I'm real safety conscious. And so I teach the students um, about what are the causes of fires and how the fire extinguishers work, different types. And I also do the same with first aid. Uh, we do um, talk about first aid for two or three days. Um, the reason being is, is uh, it might take an ambulance five, 10, 15 minutes to get there or the fire department. And so what do we do within that time frame? And, you know, keeping other students from getting injured, but at the same time, uh, the person most likely to be injured, good, bad, or indifferent, is probably the instructors because we're working around students and they make mistakes. And so, um, you know, they might need to be doing something to make sure, you know, that they can help you. Uh, and the first thing is, is them knowing how to get a hold of administration to get medical advice or medical care to you in the, in the media. So I'm um, not trying to make them paramedics, but I am trying to give them some information. Yeah, that's, that's important. Thanks, Greg. Um, personal protection equipment. Now, the stuff in yellow is what my students have to provide. They have to have it. Clear safety glasses, Z87 plus. The plus means there's, they can absorb shock. That's when you're grinding, you grab a piece of slag or metal, it hits you in the glasses, they don't shatter. You gotta have a long sleeve cotton shirt and cotton jeans. Uh, long sleeve cotton shirt's gotta be darker in color. You don't want light color when you're welding. Uh, make sure you got cotton jeans on. Uh, I tell my students, a lot of my beginning students wear coveralls, so they just put that on and they're good to go. Um, and then, yeah, boots, leather gloves, got leather, leather, these are all leather work gloves, not half synthetic. Gauntlet gloves, which are arc welding gloves, the long, long ones, and now it's gonna have to be face masks. Now, my students, I mean, you know, I've been teaching for 32 years and I used to give it away free. Nobody takes care of it. Now I make everybody buy it because they have to buy their own safety gear. It's better. It's more sanitary that way than other wearing other people's stuff. So if they cannot afford it, I buy it for them. And I make them do like a small job after school and they're more than happy to get their safety gear and do a small job for me after school. Um, that's the way I usually do it. I tell them to tell me privately if they can't afford it. And I do have students like that. So I'll buy it for them. Not the school I buy it. We're down to about five minutes, Mark. Yeah, I know. Um, we also, I have, I provide safety glasses or goggles for welding and cutting, gas well and cutting. We can provide clear face shields, shave five shields for, for cutting. Uh, we provide welding hoods. I encourage kids to buy their own. Hair ties, I always have hair ties if they don't have their own, we don't want anybody getting their hair burning or cotton equipment. And then hearing protection. I have earplugs if they want them. Or I have earmuffs too, they can use either one. So, anybody have any questions about that? For, for the boots, um, if the student doesn't have boots, can they weld in there or uh, maybe provide some of the boot covers or not, not the boot covers, but the shoe covers, the leather shoe cover covers. Have you used those and are, and do they work well? Okay. The way I usually do that is I have a lot of students that don't have boots. Mm -hmm. I have a lot. Of, I keep a lot of kids. When I clean up the lockers, they leave their almost brand new boots there. I keep them. I say, Hey, I have an area where they can go out and pick a, get, pick out a pair of boots and wear them. Okay. So that's how I do that. Do I check everybody's footwear every day? No. Do some kids sometimes wear in tennis shoes? Yes, and that's not good. 
They can, they're going to burn holes in their tanks and they're going to get a little burn hole in their foot. Yeah. So uh, boots are strongly encouraged. And I always have loaners too. Okay, here's another safety picture, a guy working on his truck. This one came out of Russia or Lithuania or somewhere like that. Um, okay, classroom safety instruction. Now, safety rule-wise, I go over all these things. We cover all this. General safety, fire pre prevention, hand tool, power tool, grinders, arc welding, oxygen, fuel cutting, because we cut with both acetylene and propane. Oxygen, acetylene welding, plasma arc cutting, air carbon arc cutting, we do all those. Exothermic cutting is a oxygen lance. Drill press, hydraulic metal shear, bandsaw, and cold saw. Now, I have a lot of safety um, handouts and stuff I use in class. At the end of this presentation, I'm giving you my email, and I will send you a copy of all that stuff I have. Do we have any questions about this? So those are a lot of times, and almost everything, you know, if you, if you talk about something, but you, you can talk about stuff in class, but if a kid's never used a tool, he didn't have an idea what you're talking about. So I always go over it in class, and then I go use the tool, and I explain Oh, this is this part. This is that part. This is what it does. So we have a better idea. Any questions? Here's a guy unloading his, his uh, track layer. Went the wrong direction. Okay, accountability in your safety program. Safety tests. I do have, have them. I have a safety contract, shop demonstrations. I just kind of mentioned that. Safety posters, safety photos, and videos. I go over safety periodically. A lot of times uh, to open a class, I will talk about safety. And I'll ask kids specific questions on something the day before. I'll ask them about plasma cutting or carbon arc cutting. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. This guy cutting a tree down, crushed his truck. Here's my safety contract right here. If you'd like a copy of that and use it, you can just take my name off and put your name on. That's fine. I will get, I'll send you a copy of that. Um, here's a modified, uh, oh, this is a Suzuki. Little uh, fabrication job. I don't know how safe that is. I don't know if I drive it. Okay, check this out. Generator, <laughs> air conditioner. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and then my last one is, this came out of Russia. Blow up pool, water, tongs holding up the power strip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at this. It's some kind of a chisel point or something holding the, the cord up in the water. Okay, so... This is our, this is Greg's uh, contact information in, my, in mine. If you want a copy of this PowerPoint, okay, I will send it to you. If you want safety tests, safety handouts, just send me an email and I'll send the stuff to you. Yeah, I think you can also do it by sending a chat right now to you, Mark, and they can uh, get that. In. I don't know. How, I don't know. How, how do I download the chat? I think the Cal Poly people can do it for us. So, otherwise, just send the emails. That's, that works great. All right. Do we have any questions? Uh, no questions, but for sure you will be uh, hearing from me. I, some of the stuff that you had is pretty good. Uh, one question that I have, do you, I, I, do, I would teach in college, so I don't need the parent portion of the contract. But I noticed that you do both tests and contracts. Uh, yeah, how do you see that combination working? I, I mean, typically I've seen either tests or contracts. Okay, well, the test, you know, makes that lets me know right away if they've been paying attention in class, you know, and, and they know basically what's got what's going on. The contract, I have the parents also sign. Okay. So, it tells the student what they're accountable for, and, and you know, and that includes their safety gear and what they're account, what, you know, what they're supposed to do. And if they don't understand something, they got to ask questions. 
And then you also, it lets the parents know what they're doing, what their son or daughter is doing in class. Okay. Okay, what thanks. I do, what I do, Victor, is my contract is at the end of the safety test, uh, I have a separate answer sheet. And once they've completed that safety test and passed it, and both Mark and I, our students have to pass it with a 100%. Um, but af after it's been graded and they pass, then they sign saying, okay, I've been instructed on how to operate safely and I will proceed in the shop according to the safety rules, which we've uh, gone. So they sign that and then that's your documentation that they've been trained, they've been tested and they're agreeing to you know, use that safety instruction, so. Okay, thank you. The, sa the safety yeah. contract, Victor, that I'm using, it was actually um, written up by a chemistry teacher and his wife, who was a lawyer, proofread it okay. and added some wording in there. So that's, okay. and I got it online. I just turned it from chemistry into welding. Okay, that's, that's excellent. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it worked pretty, it works pretty good. Any other questions from anybody? If you guys want anything, please email me and I'll send it to you. I'm glad to help you out. I'll give you my safe. If you want a copy of the safety presentation, I'll send it to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. You Thanks, bet. Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you. Everybody. thank you very much. Thank you, Roxy. Yeah, th thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending. <laughs>